some special music. <laughs> you have your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> we are nearing the end of our sermon series on the first couple of chapters of Acts. We've parked on verse 42 for, for the past few Sundays, and we will finish up verse 42 and then wrap it up next week, Lord willingly. Um, <clears throat> but as I have mentioned before, I feel that verse 42 is very important in the life of a church, for this is what the church was about doing. This is what the church was about. This is what they devoted themselves to. Namely, the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. But this is Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 42 to 47. We will read. I will be getting this on here. <clears throat> And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, and we ask you to bless it to our souls, bless it to our hearts this morning. Not only the reading of it, but the preaching of it as well. And I ask you, Father, that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit, for I cannot do anything apart from Christ and His Spirit, and I need Him. And Lord, I pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon us today, and that He will plant the Word of God deep in our hearts, that it may resonate within us, and it will create in us a desire to pray and to call out to you. Lord, you and you only can do this. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, of course, the phrase that we will be looking at today is the, the last part of verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the prayers. Ben Patterson, in his book, Deepening Your Conversation with God, spoke about Mary Slessor, a missionary to West Africa in the 19th century. Her work among orphans there was nothing short of remarkable, he writes. She was single, and her days were long and arduous, and at times lonely. She did the work of ten normal people in her lifetime. Yet she never attributed her work or her service as the real dynamic of her achievements. What did she attribute it to? Prayer and answers to prayer. She wrote home to a friend and said, My life is one long daily hourly record of answered prayer for physical health and mental overstrain, for guidance given marvelously, for enmity to the gospel subdued, for food provided at the exact hour needed, for everything else that goes to make up life in my poor service. I can testify, she says, with a full and often wonder-stricken awe that I know God answers prayer. Prayer is the greatest power God has put into our hands for service. Praying is harder than doing. But the dynamic lies that way to advance the kingdom. I have no idea how and why God has carried me over so many hard places and made these hordes submit to me, except in answer to prayer at home for me. The only way I can explain it is on the ground that I have been prayed for more than most. Pray on. Power lies that way. Here is the testimony of one who, on, who was on the front lines of kingdom work in the 1800s, who labored long into the night to advance the kingdom of God 
in the dark regions of Africa. And she says that it was not her doing that made a difference, but it was the praying of people at home. <clears throat> the real difference was made, she said, on the knees of many at home who interceded for her. I have been prayed for more than most, she humbly said. Her family, her friends, and I dare say her church gathered together to pray for her while she was on the front lines of missionary service. And it made all the difference in her life and in the lives of those she ministered to. Prayer is the turning point in any situation or purpose. Prayer makes a difference solely because we ask God to intervene in our circumstances and or another person. If the prayer of a righteous person has great power and is working, then what about the prayers of an entire church that is righteous and made holy before God and Jesus Christ? Yet, we shy away from praying in general and praying together in particular. Well, why? There are a myriad of reasons why we do not pray and pray together, but instead of focusing on them, let us see how we can devote ourselves to prayer. This is the final aspect of this verse of what the church devotes herself to. We read in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. <clears throat> by God's grace, we will travel through this sermon by way of an acronym, STEP. So we step up to prayer. The first one, S, we stick with prayer. What do we learn about the early church's prayer life? We learn that they devoted themselves to prayer. They stuck with it. We read this in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the prayers. This word devoted became the, the word associated with prayer in the early church. Well, it is only used ten times in the New Testament, five of those times refer to prayer. We know what it means to devote ourselves to something, to stick with it. We have done it in one way or another, whether it is a hobby, a sports team, a job, a television series, or a person. It means we give constant attention to something or someone. We constantly stick with it despite the obstacles and the hindrances or the setbacks. We persevere in it and long to retreat to it again and again. We constantly give our attention to it. John Piper says of this word, the ideal is to be strong and persistent and unwavering in one's assignment. Author and Pastor Steve Nation in a book called A Call to Extraordinary Prayer says the word devoted carries the sense attachment like glue. When welcoming new members into his church, he would give them a glue stick so that they would always remember that they were stuck together and stuck to certain things such as prayer. The early church was glued to prayer. Yet anyone who has ever seriously prayed knows how difficult this is. We go to our prayer closets and quickly find that our minds wander from the latest movie that we saw, to conversations with our children, to the long to-do list waiting after we pray. Cell phones, issues in our marriage or at workplaces, and home repairs often distract us from the place of prayer. Sometimes we even enter into prayer and we grow bored with it. We said the same things yesterday. Or God doesn't seem to hear. Nothing seems to be happening. He's not answering my request. And so we give up on it. It's no wonder Mary Slessor said, praying is harder than doing. And Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, prayer is a difficult matter and hard work. And there is no greater work than praying. They use the words hard and work for a reason. They knew the toil of laboring together in prayer. <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, part of the secret of sticking to prayer is a healthy understanding of what prayer is. Prayer in its simplest form is talking with God. It is the breath of a Christian. As he breathes in the word of God, he exhales praises, thanksgivings, confessions, petitions, and requests. The poet George Herbert 
said, prayer is the soul's blood. As prayer is to the body, so prayer, as, I'm sorry, as blood is to the body, so prayer is to the soul. It is the heartbeat of a Christian. Thomas Watson said, prayer is the soul's traffic with heaven. God comes down to us by his spirit and we go up to him by prayer. As we travel to our workplaces, so we must travel to prayer, to God, to heaven as it were, in the avenue of prayer. Thomas Brooks said the very soul of prayer lies in the pouring out of the soul before God. This is what prayer is. It is a pouring out of your soul, your heart, before God. Let this truth sink in. Prayer is the creature communicating with his creator, the son and or daughter communicating with her heavenly father or his heavenly father. It is the bride of Christ with her bridegroom. Whenever we pray, we go into the throne room of the almighty triune God and we talk with him. Is this not incredible that we have the privilege to do that? We are able to enter into the very presence of God and pour out our hearts to him, knowing that he hears us as a father hears his children. And we enter into his presence through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way to go to God, to a holy God, except through Him. Well, how do we do this practically? Here are some helpful practical guidelines that might help us stick to our prayers. One, remember who you are praying to. There is nothing that refreshes prayer except a renewed vision of who God is. You are coming to the Almighty God who is your Father. We are able to cast our cares upon Him because He cares for you. We are able to bring anything, no matter how great or how small, to Him, and He hears our prayers. Two, set aside time to pray. Make prayer a priority. When we fail to make prayer a priority and do not schedule an appointment with the Lord, chances are we are not going to pray. Corrie ten Boom's quote is very good advice. Don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. J.C. Riley also has good advice for this. Just as you allot time to eating and sleeping and business, so allot time to prayer. Choose your own hours and seasons. Whatever else you make a business of, make a business of prayer. Three, pray when you are most alert. Robert Murray McShane once said, I ought to spend the best hours of the day in communion with God. It is my noblest and most fruitful employment and is not to be thrust into any corner. For some of you, this is going to mean waking up at the early hours in the morning because that's when your mind is most alert and sharp and you pray. Others of you will like the midnight hours and will stay up half the night and that's when you're most alert. More power to you, I am not that kind of person. But that's when you should pray, whenever you are most alert. Four, organize your prayers. A lack of organization leads to chaos. The same is true in our prayer lives. Author and Pastor Joel Arabiki writes, prayerful praying does not happen automatically. Do not think that going to a conference, listening to a preacher, or reading a book will flip a switch inside you and make you a praying machine. You must exercise self-control, which is not a legalistic mandate, but a fruit of the Spirit prompted by the cross of Jesus Christ. Five, pray throughout the day, kindle the prayer in the morning, and you will always have burning coals throughout the day. What do we learn about the early church about prayer, we learn that first they stuck with it, they stuck to prayer. Second, we learn that we pray together. We pray together. This is implied by the word they of Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the prayers. The early church prayed together. Steve Nation observes, the way Christians pray in the book of Acts is largely corporate in nature. We see this vividly throughout the book of Acts. Even before the Spirit descended upon them on Pentecost, they gathered together and prayed. We saw this in Acts 1.14. All these with one accord were devoting themselves 
to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. The apostles, Jesus' mother and his brothers, they gathered together and they prayed before Pentecost. When Pentecost came, what did the Spirit uh, drive them to do? He drove them to their knees, drove them to prayer. When Peter and John in Acts 4 were arrested because they proclaimed Jesus, they came back. When they were released, they came back and they told their friends what had happened. We read in Acts 4.24, and when they heard it, now, what do you think they did? What do you think? Did they form a political party and rally their cause for no harm against Christians? Did they make a petition to the government to stop persecution? No. What did they do? And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, what did they do when persecution was against them? They went to their friends and said, Hey, we got to pray. And that's what they did. They prayed. Later, when Peter was in prison, the early church gathered together and they prayed for him. They didn't, store, they didn't gather swords and clubs and storm the gates of the prison. No, they came together and they stormed the gates of heaven with prayer. Acts 2, 12, 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. They prayed together for his release. And what happened? He was released. Again and again in the book of Acts, you see believers gathering together and praying, and that makes a difference. The early church did not have a one-time prayer meeting and call it quits after the Spirit of God descended on them. No, indeed, again and again, they met together for prayer. What does it mean that they prayed together? Well, they obviously gathered together, but there's one other aspect of what it means. When they gathered together for prayer, they prayed together in agreement. We see this in the beginning of Acts 1.14. All these in one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. The words in one accord means that they prayed with one mind or one purpose. They were in agreement with each other. We could call it unity and purpose or united prayer as other versions translate it. These early believers gathered together and prayed for one particular thing, and in this case, it was the promised Holy Spirit. By way of illustration praying, of praying in agreement, you could take any sports team that you want. Anyone knows that if a football team does not play together, nothing happens. They don't advance the line. They fumble, they make mistakes, and the other team gets the ball. If a guard and tackle positions do not do their job to protect the quarterback, what happens? He gets sacked. Everyone knows that when a team plays together, though, great things will happen. They are united. They come out on the field as a united front. And so it is with the church. When the church gathers together and prays together, we come as a united front. We come in agreement with one another. Jonathan Edwards, a pastor and theologian of the 18th century, said of united prayer, such a union in prayer for the general outpouring of the Spirit of God would not only be beautiful, but profitable too. Union in prayer is a beautiful thing, for in it we get a picture of what heaven is like. It is profitable, for it promotes mutual love for one another. I know I gave this illustration before, but I think we need to hear its encouragement again. Dr. R.A. Torrey, an evangelist and pastor in the 19th century America, tells of a church situated in a little town in Maine. And he said, up in a little town in Maine, things were pretty dead some years ago. The churches were not accomplishing anything. There were a few godly men in the churches, and they said, here we are, only uneducated laymen, but something must be done in this town. Let's form a praying band. We will, center, we will all center our prayers on one man. Who shall it be? They picked out one of the hardest men in town, a hopeless drunkard, and centered all their prayers upon him. In a week, he was converted. Then they took up another and another, until within a year, two or three hundred were brought to God, and fire spread out into the surrounding country. 
definite prayer for the, those in the prison house of sin is the need of ours. Oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, the need of the hour is the same as it has always been. People are in the prison house of sin. And are we going to, do we have a burden for their, our lost loved ones, our lost neighbors, our lost community? Do we have a burden to gather together and call out to God in prayer for them? This is the need of the hour, and we pray for God's kingdom to come. We pray that they will, He will open the eyes of the blind so that they will see. We pray that they, God will open the hearts of those whose hearts are hardened. That's what we pray for. As it takes a whole village to raise a child, it takes a whole church to teach us how to pray. So I plead with you to come to prayer meetings. A few points of application for this. Pray with your spouse if you are married. Pray with your spouse. <clears throat> Husbands and wives who pray together, stay together. Two, pray with your family. Set aside time with your family to pray for your needs for each other. Go beyond your own needs and pray for your neighbors or pray for missionaries. Three, find a prayer partner of the same gender or a group of people who will pray. My mother-in-law belonged to a group of moms in prayer. And while the kids were at school, the moms came together and prayed on however frequent it was. Four, if you come together as a group, start praying immediately. Unless someone has a great emergency or prayer request, don't take prayer requests. Just start praying. Five, come to the prayer meetings here at the church. Let us intercede for the kingdom of God to come upon our church, upon our families, upon this community, upon the Illinois Valley. Let us come and gather together in prayer. So we have looked at the first two letters. We have looked at S. We have to stick with prayer. And we have looked at the T. We have to pray together. What else do we learn from the early church's prayer life? We eagerly await God's promise. We eagerly await God's promise. We see this in Acts 1. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, we read in Acts 1-4 that he ordered his apostles not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. When they asked about the coming kingdom, he told them not to concern themselves with it. Instead, he said in Acts 1-8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Then Jesus ascended into heaven and was taken out of their sight. Immediately after the ascension of Jesus into heaven, they returned to Jerusalem. And what did they do while they were there? How did they wait for the promise of the Father? Did they begin to strategize how to reach Jerusalem? No, they did not. Did they plan how to evangelize the rest of Judea and Samaria? No. Did they write out a three-year goal of how to reach the nations? No. Did they return to their old occupations as Peter curiously did after the resurrection? No, they did not. Did they pick up the Jerusalem Times or play games to pass the time? No. Did they post their testimonies on the community board or Facebook if they had it? No, they did not. What did they do? They gathered together and they prayed. We read in Acts 1, 12 to 13 that they returned to Jerusalem to wait. And in verse 14 we read, all of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. The Christian Standard Bible puts it this way, they were all were continually united in prayer. Jesus told them to wait, and they waited by praying. This particular word for wait has the nuance of looking for something with eager anticipation. There is a sense of expectancy in the air, an atmosphere of excitement, and a steadfast hope that God will fulfill what he has promised. To wait, someone once said, is not merely to remain impassive. It is to expect, to look for with patience, and also with submission. It is to long for, but not impatiently, to look for, but not to fret at the delay, to watch for, but not restlessly. Do we pray in this way? Do we eagerly await God's answer in prayer? When we get into our places of prayer, when we gather together with prayer, do we eagerly await God to fulfill his promises to us? 
Do we believe that God not only hears our prayers, but he answers them as well? Do we have the confidence in God like David had when he wrote Psalm 6-9, The Lord has heard my plea, the Lord accepts my prayer. Or in Psalms 34-6, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Our prayers are energized when we wait on God and realize that God hears our prayers and will fulfill his promises in our lives. What do we eagerly wait for? In prayer, we wait for the promises of God to be fulfilled, for the answers to come. The particular promise the apostles waited for was the Holy Spirit, and God answered their requests, and the Spirit came. Whenever we base our prayers on the Word of God, then we eagerly await an answer. It might be long in coming, but we should never grow discouraged or faint-hearted. This waiting for God combats the instant gratification that overwhelms our society. We live in a society that promotes it. When we want a piece of knowledge, we whip out our cell phones, and with a few swipes of our fingertips, we have that piece of knowledge in front of us. If we do not want to wait for the weather report on the six o'clock news, we look it up on the internet. If we want food and do not wish to spend the time cooking it, we throw in a microwave dinner or go to a fast food place to have it your way right away. This weaves its way into the moral fabric of our lives in innumerable ways and produces anxieties and fears. Yet prayer combats this tendency because in, <clears throat> me, in it we depend upon God, we wait on Him. When we pray, it is like sowing a seed of God's promise in the ground. As we continue to pray, we water that seed, which then sprouts up. As we continue to pray, we tend to the little plant and weed it and water it, and eventually it will grow so that we can harvest it. <clears throat> in prayer, the promises of God find their fulfillment. In prayer, God's plans become plain. There is a story of George Mueller who saw hundreds of specific answers to prayer. One day, he started to pray for five of his friends. Within a few months, one came to the Lord. He continued to pray on. Ten years later, another of his friend, two, year, two other friends were saved. Twenty-five years after he had started praying, the fourth friend became a Christian and was saved. Fifty-two years later, had passed and Mueller died without seeing his fifth friend's salvation. However, shortly after his funeral, the fifth friend became a Christian. <clears throat> Every day for 52 years, George Mueller prayed heavenward and waited for an answer. Can we say this in our own prayer lives? Pray for the word of God and the promises of God to be fulfilled in your life. Persevere in prayer, but eagerly await God's answers to your prayers. So we have looked at the S to stick with prayer. We have looked at the T. We pray together. We looked at the E. Eagerly expect, eagerly await God's answers, God's promises. The fourth and final, we pray for the proclamation or the preaching of the Word of God. The success of the Word of God is proclaimed Proclaimed rises and falls as the pastor and the people pray. Notice what the apostles prayed for in Acts 4, 29-30. This prayer is in the aftermath of Peter and John's arrest and subsequent release. When they gathered with their friends, friends, what did they pray for? We read, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The prayer is too full. Look upon the threats of those in authority and grant to your servants the boldness to preach your word. God may or may not do the signs and wonders. That's his prerogative. We can pray for those things, but we should specifically pray <clears throat> that the Lord will give us the ability to proclaim Christ and his word. When we pray this way, we ultimately pray, Your kingdom come. 
For God's kingdom comes when the gospel is proclaimed. And what happened as a result to their prayer in verse 41? And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. This has two specific points of application. First, pray for me as I preach and teach the word of God to you. Pastors particularly need the prayers of their people. Pastors and their wives and families do. The great apostle Paul was not so proud to ask the churches to pray for him and his ministry crew. He said to the Ephesians, pray also for me that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. To the Colossians he said at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Ian Bounds in his book, The Weapon of Prayer, writes, prayer in the pew gives the preached word energy, facility, and success. He also says a praying church creates a spiritual atmosphere most favorable to preaching. So pray for me. Charles Spurgeon, the great uh, Baptist preacher in London during the 1800s, was once asked, what is the secret to your success? And he paused for a moment, and then he said, my people pray for me. Pray for the success of God's word in your own heart, in the hearts of the people of this church, and in the community in the Illinois Valley. Now second, it doesn't only mean that we, you pray for me every Sunday morning, though please pray for me every Sunday morning, please pray throughout the week, but it also means that you should pray for yourself to have that boldness to preach the gospel. Someone once said, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Probably the person who said it saw a disconnect between those who were preaching and their personal lives. But I am telling you that you have to speak the words eventually. A person, a non-Christian, cannot just look at your life and see that it is good. They might draw any number of conclusions. How are they supposed to know that you are a Christian? That you have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ? That you are a child of God? Yes, by your light, let your light so shine before others. But you have to speak the word to them. They might draw any number of conclusions. They might think you're a Buddhist. They might think that, well, you're into that love is love thing. They might think that you're just a good person, a good neighbor. But they will not draw the conclusion that you have been radically saved by Jesus Christ unless you tell them. So pray for an open door. Pray that God will open your mouth. Pray that God will open your neighbor's hearts. <coughs> and for this we must pray. Pray for boldness, as the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6.20, that I may declare boldly as I ought to speak. What do we learn from the church, early church's prayer of life? We learn that they stick with prayer. They pray together. They eagerly await God's promises to be fulfilled. And they prayed for the proclamation of the word of God. I will close with this story from Ben Patterson's book, Deepening Your Conversation with God. Bob Bake of National Prayer Advance tells of churches in Ipswich, Ipswich, Massachusetts, and their experience of this kind of prayer. After the first great awakening, three churches in this community covenanted to follow the pattern suggested by Jonathan Edwards. In each congregation, cell groups would meet weekly in prayer. Monthly, the separate congregations would then gather the cells and conduct an all-church prayer meeting meetings of agreement. Then quarterly, all three would come together for the same kind of prayer, praying. This pattern was followed faithfully without interruption for a century. Two remarkable things happened during this time. All three churches reported periodic harvest or in gathering of souls in which there would be a number of new believers brought into the congregation about every eight to 10 years. Also during this time, all of New England was being swept by universalism and Unitarianism, these various heresies, but not these three churches. They remained firmly true to the faith while apostasy swirled around them, but not over them. 
Around the time of the Civil War, the prayer meeting ceased. Within five years, these churches all capitulated to Unitarianism. Patterson ends the section with these words, in times of intense spiritual conflict, simple, unified, corporate prayer can be literally the difference between life and death. <coughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, I do not need to tell you the state of our nation, the state of our schools, the state of our families. The need is the same. The need is now to come together and pray, and pray for God's kingdom to come in our own lives, in the lives of our family, in the lives of the schools, in the lives of the community, in the lives of this nation. This is the need of the hour. And pray we must, our lives, the lives of our loved ones, of our the life of this church depends upon it. So rise up, Seatonville Community Church. Rise up and seek God in prayer. If we do not, we will not stand. Let's pray. Amen. <clears throat> Father in heaven, you have called us to pray, and I pray that you will put in our hearts a desire to pray, that we will see that we are in a great spiritual conflict, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with against the principalities and powers of darkness, and we must come to you for help. We must come to you for strength. And I pray that we will see this, that we will realize this, and we will pray. Oh God, I pray that we will pray. Teach us how to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.